thank you, Jessica and Bob. Just so grateful for you two and leading us in worship. Have you heard the phrase, there is no I in team? <laughs> um, but, you know, is that true? Don, can you show us that slide? No I in team? I think you're mistaken. <laughs> You know, here in Colorado, we, we celebrate the, the rugged individual, right? You know, American culture is, is all about the, the individual. We believe in independence and self-reliance. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps, as we say. And, and while there can be real benefit in some of these values, there's also a danger when we take this individualism and bring it into our theology. Today, we're continuing our series, To Be Honest. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We've talked about how being honest and telling the truth has the power to set us free. We've talked about being honest about our own stories being honest with God through the practices of lament and confession. And, and last week, Katie started us on this trajectory of being honest about the race-based conflict that we see in our nation today. Specifically, she talked about the need for a holistic understanding of the gospel, that it's not just about individuals, it's also about all of creation. It's not just about souls, it's also about bodies. It's not just about the future, it's also about the here and now. Now, in some parts of the church, people say things like, racism is a political issue, it's not a gospel issue. We only preach the gospel. But here's the problem with that. Racism, is sin. And if we don't address it as a sin, we won't be able to bring the resources of the gospel to bear on it. But if we misunderstand what sin is, we won't address the full problem. We have to recognize that sin isn't just about our hearts. So today we're going to look at scripture and talk about the problem of sin and how it relates to racial conflict and injustice. What we're going to see is this, that sin is worse than we think. It's not just individual, it's communal, it's corporate, it's institutional, it's structural. In the words of author and pastor Tim Keller, we are far worse than we ever imagined but we're also far more loved than we could ever dream. So friends, let's begin with prayer. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for your love and for your grace, and we are grateful for your truth, your truth that changes us, your truth that transforms us and transforms the world around us. And so Lord, right now we declare, we need you. By your Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? We ask this, not because we are worthy of this. We ask this because of your great mercy. We thank you, amen. This morning we are looking at the book of Daniel chapter nine. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there with me, Daniel chapter 9. The book of Daniel tells the story of the aftermath of the Babylonian Empire's siege of Jerusalem. The empire takes a group of young Jewish men, including a young man named Daniel, he takes them captive to serve in the royal courts of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel and his friends are pressured to conform to Babylon's culture of injustice and idolatry but they stand firm in their commitment to the Lord God. But they also do something odd. 
they seek the flourishing of Babylon, just as the prophet Jeremiah instructed the Jerusalem exiles to do. And so Daniel serves faithfully in the royal court of Babylon for decades. Nebuchadnezzar is succeeded by Belshazzar. Then Belshazzar is succeeded by Darius the Mede. At this point, Daniel is no longer a young man, and he's wondering how much longer is all this going to last? And that brings us to Daniel 9. I encourage you to keep your Bibles open, and we're going to walk through today's passage uh, a little bit as we go. So we're going to start in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. Now, side note, Dan Darius was an in-between king. His rule was a period of great uncertainty for the Jewish exiles. It was the beginning of the end of the Babylonian, em Babylonian Empire. Very soon, the Persian King Cyrus was going to come and conquer Babylon and permit the Jews to return home and rebuild the temple. But not yet. We also know from Daniel 6 that Darius was the sort of guy who was okay taking people who prayed to anyone but him and feeding them to lions. So maybe not the nicest guy. This was a time of uncertainty. And what was the result of all this uncertainty? It pressed Daniel into searching the scriptures. We face so much uncertainty right now. Where do we go in the face of uncertainty? Daniel went to the scriptures. Okay, let's read on. Verse two. In the first year of King Darius's reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word the Lord had given Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Now the prophet Jeremiah received a prophetic word from the Lord, and he wrote a letter to the exiles in Babylon. It's recorded in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29. This is what it says. This is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. So Daniel reads this, and he clings to this hope that the end of the exile is near. And so how does he respond? He does exactly what Jeremiah said to do. He begins to pray. He begins to seek the Lord with all his heart. So back to Daniel 9, verse 3. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Daniel turns to the Lord, fasts and prays. He puts on sackcloth and ashes, all these symbols of repentance. Now, what is repentance? Uh, our friends at Gravity Leadership uh, think that repentance has gotten a bit of a bad rap. They define repentance as agreeing with God about reality. And they also say it's the best thing that can happen to you today. Think about that. Repentance is the best thing that can happen to you today. Why? Because it means you're stepping more fully into Christ's kingdom. Remember, it's the truth that sets us free. Verse 4 says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. That word in our Hebrew, or in it, that word in the English Bible translated confessed is a Hebrew word that means to make yourself known, <coughs> to heal yourself. So as we've seen throughout this series, honesty and truth-telling are crucial. They open the door to freedom. So we keep reading. Daniel begins his prayer. Lord, 
the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Do you notice how Daniel roots his prayer in God's character? He's the Lord, the God of covenant love, the faithful one, overflowing with loving kindness. Daniel goes on. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Now, we often think of sin as individual actions, the things I do. But, but sin is much worse than that. Did you notice how our chapter starts in the first person, singular? Daniel says, I, Daniel. But now, here, it switches to the first person, plural. We have sinned. We have rebelled. We have turned away. You see, Daniel isn't just confessing his own personal sins. He's confessing the sins of his people, his community, his nation. If you look at the earlier chapters of the book, it's pretty clear that Daniel is an exemplary person. He does not compromise with the Babylonian culture. He stands up and stands apart at the risk of his own life on more than one occasion, all so that he can be faithful to the covenant and to the Lord. Why then does Daniel confess these sins of other people? Well, let's keep reading in verse seven. Daniel says, Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings and our princes and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. Again, we see Daniel confessing all these sins, even the sins of his ancestors, people long dead. This, doesn't just, this, this just doesn't make sense to our modern sensibilities. We say, well, I'm responsible for my own free choices, my actions. And you know, we as Americans think this way, because of the influence of philosophers like John Locke and David Hume. Our culture has absorbed this ideology of individualism. We believe that people are primarily defined or even exclusively defined by their individual choices. But the Bible doesn't actually think this way. Scripture thinks in terms of individuals as well as groups of people, communities, Think about the scripture that we heard earlier in the service from Romans 5. It says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone, because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. Sin and right standing with God aren't simply individual matters. They are corporate and communal. We all sinned in Adam, and if we are in Christ, we have right standing with God as a gift. Neither of these are the result of our individual actions. Now, most weeks, as part of our gathered worship here at Corona, we will say a, a communal prayer of confession. I remember um, for Katie and I at our former church, there was a person who objected to this practice. She said, I haven't done any of those things, so why do I need to confess them? But when we pray these confessions to God, we're not just confessing each of our own individual sins. We're actually confessing our sin as a body, and we're confessing the sin of the capital C Church. Okay, so let's look at verse 9. Daniel goes on. 
The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed against your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the word spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Friends, there are consequences to sin, and not just to ourselves. You see, sin isn't just about our individual actions. No, actually, sin is a force. It's a power of evil. I recently watched a, a live stream of Esau McCulley, a professor of New Testament at Wheaton College, and he reminded me of Genesis 4, where God says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. In the scripture, sin is depicted as a beast ready to pounce, a demonic power that wants to master us. So it's not just about our individual actions. It's actually a force that's at work in the world. And Macaulay goes further and asks the question, what happens when those who are mastered by sin start to build cities and cultures? Well, the answer to that is that they use their power to give rain to their sinful desires. And that's why, while sin may start in the heart, it doesn't stay in the heart. It's corrosive and infectious. It spreads through communities and cultures. It seeps into everything we touch. Why does God destroy the city of Jerusalem? Not just any city, his city. Because this power of sin manifests itself in our institutions and our structures. Think about the U.S. Constitution, an incredible document, a landmark in human history. But at the same time, the Constitution defined African slaves as three-fifths of a person, not fully human. Now, the history of slavery in our country is truly horrific. And the brutal truth is that the church was often complicit in the sin of slavery. But it can be easy for us today to imagine that this history is just simply locked in the past. Sometimes people say things like, well, shouldn't we be past all that now? Well, last week, Katie quoted Brian Stevenson director of the Equal Justice Initiative and author of Just Mercy. And I wanna read uh, this quote from Brian Stevenson. The great evil of American slavery was not involuntary servitude and forced labor. To me, the great evil of slavery was the narrative of racial difference, the ideology of white supremacy that we created to make ourselves feel comfortable with enslaving people who are black. We've never addressed that legacy. He says that's why he doesn't believe slavery ended in 1865. It simply evolved. Now in his book, Beyond Racial Gridlock, Christian sociologist George Yancey describes the formation of the FHA loan program in 1937, a program in which the government backed the mortgages uh, uh, and kept uh, low interest rates so that people could afford to purchase housing. But there, there was a problem. Yancey writes, segregated neighborhoods were seen as necessary to ensure that interracial friendships and romantic involvements did not develop. To prevent the FHA program from being used to create multiracial neighborhoods, Loans were not given to black people if they were going to use these loans to integrate a neighborhood. Now, 
this is tied to the whole history of a practice called redlining, which was a practice that denied federally subsidized home loans to specific neighborhoods based on race. And meanwhile, the FHA underwrote the building of suburbs with the explicit understanding that these neighborhoods would not be integrated. Now, Don, can you show us um, that map of, of Denver? So Don's gonna show us a map of Denver, and this is actually a red line map of, of our own city. I want you to just take a moment and, and look at this image. The, this history of this practice of redlining literally shaped how our cities were built. And the, that history is still with us today. Yancey goes on to describe um, how this is felt by black communities today. Residential segregation influences school financing because most school districts rely heavily on property taxes. If the homes in a school district have high economic value, then the schools in that district are likely to receive the, the, the money that they need. The result is that schools in poorer neighborhoods fail to get the funding they need to do an adequate job of educating children. Friends, we can't just pretend that this whole history should be past us by now. No, we have to actually confess these sins, these sins that are woven into the very fabric of our society. We have to lament the ongoing hurt and harm that these systems built by sin continue to do, pe to do to people living in our city. And in the words of John the Baptist, we have to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, let's look back at Daniel 9, verse 13. Daniel says, just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. Remember, friends, God's truth sets us free. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day. We have sinned. We have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the inequities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. That bears repeating. We do not make requests of God because we are righteous, but because of his great mercy. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. And this is most clearly seen in Jesus Christ, who shows us the fullness of God. Jesus shows us God's essential character. God is love. And there is no contradiction between God's love and God's justice. God's justice is a manifestation of God's love. Sin and injustice angers God precisely because it does harm to people dearly loved by God. It's two sides of the same coin. To quote Tim Keller again, the truth of the gospel is this. We are far worse than we ever imagined, but we are far more loved than we could ever dream. We are far worse than we ever imagined, but we are far 
more loved than we could ever dream. It's not our righteousness that gives us right standing before God. It's not our justice, our worthiness, our holiness, our capacity for being good or doing good. No, it's Jesus, his righteousness, his grace that covers us. Back to Romans 5, it says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Our sin isn't just our individual actions, but our righteousness isn't based on our individual actions either. If you've committed your life to Jesus, you are in Christ, and you can know that you are secure in Christ's love. And that means, friends, that we can have the confidence to face the truth. We can be honest without fear. Because of Jesus, we are forgiven. And so in Daniel 9, verse 19, Daniel concludes his prayer. He says, Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. We're grateful for God's word. Amen. So what do we do with all of this? Well, the first thing I'd like to say is just this. Like Daniel, our first step must be confession and repentance and lament. It might be painful to confront the truth of our racialized sins, both as individuals, as a community, and as a nation. But that honesty can open the door for healing. Here's how one pastor put it recently. Today, we have many Bible-believing Christians who love to talk about, we need revival, we need renewal. But anytime you look in scripture or look into church history, you see that revival and renewal always follows prayer and repentance. And it is the same in our day. Healing for the race-based conflict we see around us can only begin with deep, spirit-fused repentance. Friends, do we want to see our nation and our communities healed? Do we need revival and renewal? It can only begin with deep, spirit-infused repentance. So let's just take a few moments, and in the silence, I want to invite you to talk to God. Take a deep breath and listen. Rest in the Lord's presence. Lord Jesus, it is not because of our righteousness that we make requests of you. It is because of your great mercy. So, Lord, we ask you for healing. We ask you for wholeness, and we confess our sins to you. 
we confess, most merciful God, that we have, can, that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed, in what we have done and in what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we might delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Amen.